So we're ready for our last two talks and then the afternoon is over, it's just so sad. Our next speaker is Sean Aldridge. He started college with the goal of an MFA in writing, but he got lost in the engineering building and ended up with a degree in robotics somehow. Um, I just get lost and I cry, so he did a lot better than me. I have an, um, he has an enduring love of Russian literature, William Gibson, and pretty much anything involving being near trees. So we must be really happy in Portland. Please welcome Sean Aldridge. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to my talk on design reviews, controlling for change at speed. Uh, give a little bit of an overview about why I might be standing up on a stage talking about this. Uh, hi, I'm Sean Aldridge, and I proverbially live just down the road in Eugene. Uh, that is a shot of me in the Eugene airport. That is a beaver in a duck costume. That is as far as I'm going into Oregon sports politics. Uh, I'm not touching that. Uh, I am currently working at Tinder. I am a senior software engineer on the backend revenue team. I have been working in tech since 2003-ish. I have been programming professionally since 2009-ish. Uh, and more interestingly, personally, lately, I raise dairy goats. Uh, that little guy that you see on the slide right there is Bucket. If you would ever like a funny story about why his name is Bucket that will not be featured in this talk, feel free to corner me in a hallway sometime and I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, you will see my goats featured throughout the talk because they're cute and it's an excuse to talk about them in a room where people can't really get away from me. Um, and finally, uh, you will have seen an et al on the byline for this talk. I want to acknowledge that the work that I am presenting here today was largely done by the Design Review Working Group at Tinder. I was a major part of that group, but it does take a village. I'm just the only one who actually wanted to get up on stage and talk about it after the fact, but it took all of us to get here. So, if you are familiar with my abstract, you will know where this is going, but it's kind of my intro, so uh, I have two easy questions for you, and for me, two upsetting ones. Uh, the easy ones are going to be, what is the oldest system that you regularly work on, and what does it do? So, for me, this would probably be the iOS purchase flow at Tinder, and roughly speaking, it exchanges payment tokens for features. And now the more frustrating ones, how does it do that, and why does it do it in that way? I could answer this for our iOS purchase flow, but it would take me a minimum of a few hours, possibly a couple of days, uh, to explain it in reasonable detail, and I can quite comfortably tell you that the why has long since been lost to the mists of time. Ooh, nope, not that yet. Uh, so, but why do we care about this, right? I've told you that I could tell you how it works, and I could probably make up a reason why. Why do you actually want to know the why? Well, uh, I'm going to give you the point of view of a naive but curious goat in this instance. Here you see uh, Cherry and Dizzy. Uh, these are two of our yearlings. And as we often do in the barn, we're going to talk about software documentation. <laughs> So, uh, in order to frame this discussion, I'm going to introduce you briefly to Diataxis. Diataxis is a framework that I personally learned about from watching Write the Docs talks. Uh, it was developed by Daniela Prochida. I think I saw it at one of the 2021 talks. And it is, as it says on the slide, a systematic approach to technical documentation authoring. In short, it's just a framework that helps us think about the types of docs that we might be writing and what sort of content, tone, and voice that we would take when writing those docs. So drilling into the section that we're talking about today, uh, we're going to live in the lower left quad quadrant of Diataxis, so this is explanatory documentation. This is documentation that is meant to aid with your understanding. So this will be internal documentation that is generally uh, facing your engineers uh, and is going to be used for your engineers to understand the systems that they are working in on a regular basis. So, what is its purpose? Once again, shared understanding, right? The systems that we work in are inherently complex. Once you reach a certain scale, no one person is going to be able to understand all of it. If I put you in a room and I sit you down with five engineers that are working on a system and feeling particularly cruel, I ask you to have them explain to you how that system works, you are going to get, at minimum, five different versions of how that system works. 
right? Explanatory documentation brings this understanding closer together, right? You're still going to get at least five explanations, but they're going to have a lot of the same words over time. So it starts, it starts to unify that understanding. Secondly, it creates a historical record, right? If we write down what we built, we all understand it a little better. And if we get somebody new, instead of having to sit them down and give them all of those explanations again, they can read that documentation. If I had you write down those five, or if I had you take those five explanations from those five engineers, and then four of them go on vacation and you have a question, you would better hope the fifth engineer has time in their schedule, or, and I don't feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, you should hope that you have written it down, right? And then finally, it simplifies technical details. We have this explanatory documentation because at least in the software world, the code might be the source of truth, right? The code will definitely tell you what's happening, but it is by definition more complex. It's more verbose, and getting an answer from it is going to take longer. It's much quicker to pull that an uh, answer out of the documentation that you've already written down. So understanding the purpose for this, who are the audience for it? Well, largely engineers. As we said, uh, engineers are the ones who are going to be tasked with expanding the systems uh, or maintaining the systems that they're working on. So they're going to be mostly who's reading this, right? We want to understand who's reading our documentation because that informs how we're going to write it. But engineers are not the only consumers of these docs. Your customer agents are often going to have a particularly sticky question uh, that they might need to answer with your explanatory documentation. And your product and management layer are often going to need to access these as well. They might be uh, planning for how long a given project is going to take. Wait, why are you going away on me? Planning for uh, how long a given uh, expansion might take, or trying to figure out, like, we want to build out new features. You kind of need to understand what's there already. And finally, our authors. Uh, even goats know that authors matter. It always matters who's writing the documentation because that's going to frame what it looks like and that's going to inform a lot of the content. Uh, firstly, it's going to be engineers. Uh, and this can be the frustrating part because as previous talks have mentioned, we're not by nature trained writers. But we are mostly going to be the ones who are tasked with writing this. We will occasionally, when headcount allows, enjoy the assistance of skilled technical writers usually is a force multiplier for work that the engineers are already going to put in. So usually you're going to have the engineer sit down and write out the gist of it, and then somebody who actually works in words more often is going to come by and make that a little more understandable. And depending on where you work, engineering leadership also contributes to these a fair amount. Uh, I will credit that with the fact that I see more of this at Tinder because a lot of our leadership are just ex-engineers, so they're familiar with a lot of this documentation already. So, I will assume that I have at this point explained to you why you might want explanatory documentation, right? So we're all roughly on the same page. That's neat. How do we get from the general case of we like explanatory documentation to Tinder is implementing design reviews? I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, actually, I asked. Uh, and in order to get there, I'm going to need to tell you a little bit about how things work at Tinder. So a tiny bit of background here. Uh, the Tinder engineering team is 12 years old now uh, and has generally stood on two fairly firm cultural pillars, autonomy and experimentation. You're going to hear autonomy a lot throughout the rest of the course of this talk. Autonomy in two ways. One, individual autonomy. We run a fairly lean team. We have roughly 300 engineers, which sounds like a lot, but we have a 300 million user base. So one engineer per million users is actually uh, fairly lean. And that means our engineers need to work very efficiently. And in order to empower this, we have a lot of latitude in how we want to build a given system, how we want to solve a given problem. We are usually tasked with, we would like the app to do this. And then an individual engineer is given latitude as to what the system that solves that problem will look like. We also, very importantly, have a lot of autonomy at the team level. So individual teams are given a great deal of latitude in the processes that they're going to implement, what their day-to-day -day engineering looks like, the kind of ceremonies that they're going to have that get their job done. This is a very bottom-up org. You don't really get a situation where it's like, hey, X uh, C-suite has said, you have to do it like this. That's going to get a lot of pushback at Tinder. And then the other pillar that we're going to really feature is experimentation. Uh, any 
feature that is live in Tinder today has undergone rigorous testing against different versions of itself, against whether or not it should exist, against possible competing features across an, uh, a variety of metrics. So uh, we're standing on those two pillars uh, for the purposes of this talk. Let's talk a little bit about what the numbers look like. Uh, first off, I mentioned those reasonably autonomous teams. You can slice a team a lot of ways, right? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of different definition of, definitions of it. A team could be uh, people in HR, it could be people in GitHub, it could be people sitting at the table with you. But we're talking fairly engineer-centric right now, so for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna slice it with GitHub. If you look in GitHub right now, Tinder Engineering has roughly 40 teams. Across those 40 teams, we currently have 1,100 experiments running today. That's not historical experiments, that's live right now. I will be a little nitpicky uh, and say some of these are of varying degrees of validity, some of them are glorified defaults that a lot wouldn't change if you switched it off, but generally speaking, there are 1,100 switches that you could flip and change the behavior of Tinder for one or more users. So 40 teams, 1,100 experiments, all with a great deal of autonomy. What could possibly go wrong in this situation? Well, we sat down and we cataloged it <laughs> because uh, we, as a working group, were tasked with uh, building our documentation in a way that empowered these teams to move faster, but at the same time control chaos a little bit. And when we started looking into the problems that we had, we found it uh, distributed across four rough categories. First, fragmentations. That afore, uh, aforementioned autonomy, teams are given a great deal of latitude in how they want to do things, but that means if I, on team A, figure out a cool new way to do something, my friend over here on team B can't really benefit from it unless their processes are close to mine, right? Uh, unless there's some sort of overlap there, they can't really benefit from the new thing that I might have figured out. Secondly, brittleness. Lack of documentation, lack of design review in this case, has led to us launching multiple systems that interacted with our backend in very unpredictable ways once they launched. Ways that, upon post-mortem review, could have been caught and mitigated had somebody gotten eyes on it beforehand, somebody with the, the relevant amount of experience. Duplication. So we've got 40 teams moving in 40 different directions. It is a near mathematical certainty that at some point they will duplicate technology. I can say this confidently because at some point was roughly four and a half years ago now, and it's something that we've run into over and over again. There's only so many use cases in web development for software. And finally, inefficiency. So I mentioned we've been around 12 years now. Uh, the volume of code that we are maintaining is now greater than the volume of code that we launch in a given year, and unless something truly drastic changes, this will be true for the duration of time that Tinder exists, right? So this means if you want to build something within Tinder today, the greatest burden of complexity that you are going to have is not going to be building that thing, it's going to be that thing's integration into the other things around it and uh, lack of context into how those things function will greatly slow and complicate that integration. So Honey here finds these problems alarming. I'm, I'm sure you can see that. Uh, I am going to tell you in the remaining time of this talk how we solved all of these problems perfectly forever. <laughs> e except we're living in the real world here, so I'm going to tell you how we made things incrementally better for at least some version of better. Uh, and I'm gonna have a short sidebar about the joys of working with engineers, uh, which I feel like is gonna resonate well with this room. <laughs> so uh, we've talked about explanatory documentation. We're moving in the direction of design reviews, like what is the solution for all of these problems that I've mentioned? Well, you've seen the title of the talk, so obviously I'm going to say design reviews, but what does that actually mean for all of us in this room today? For the purposes of this talk, a design review is Simply, a review process for all significant, and I'll get to that question mark, changes that we propose to make to a system we already have. Uh, the question mark comes uh, as a benefit from that aforementioned autonomy. We're not dictating what significant means. We're launching a design review process for all of Tinder engineering. Different teams have different lines for significant, right? 
What might seem real serious to the Android team might be a tiny update for the backend team. Maybe that doesn't require an entire design review. So we're not going to tell you, your team, your guild, what significant means. But we are going to tell you, you have to define it. And then, the short version of this is, once we have decided that this is a significant change, you are going to sit down with all of the involved teams in this change, everyone who might be affected by it, and you're going to write down your proposed changes, and then the short version is, everybody's going to try and poke holes in it. Um, and this is where I want to emphasize, you will note the bolding and italicization on good faith here. Uh, this is a process that I have very much come to love, but it requires a good faith interpretation for your colleagues, right? So when you sit down with a proposal that they have, my job, especially as a senior engineer, is going to be to incredibly politely and with kindness in my heart, tear it apart. Right? I'm going to try and figure out everything that could go wrong with this. I'm going to try and figure out how it's not going to scale. I'm going to try and figure out how somebody's going to abuse it and break the security on it. I'm going to try and figure out how we can not do this at all. Right? So how I can just take an existing system, move it a little bit, and everything's good. So you have to come into this believing that the people in the room with you are here for a good faith process. This is very important. The first few meetings that you sit down in for a design review are exercises in not taking things personally. That said, uh, once I have gotten over this myself, I have found these to be wonderful. You just get everybody, we sit down, and we talk through what might go wrong here. I will put a small addendum here of, I feel like this could be a completely asynchronous process. Um, I have seen it in other instances be asynchronous, but it places a much higher burden of communication on the teams involved. And most of the time, it's just simpler for everybody to sit down uh, virtually or in person. And then everybody signs off on this. We agree, OK, this is a thing we want to do. And somebody goes off and builds it. right? So we have a recorded thing that says, here are the changes we have. And everybody says, this is at least some version of good. So uh, the big question that I have when I first looked at this is, how is this different from your existing systems documentation that we are probably desperately trying to maintain? Right? So everybody probably has some sort of, like if you work in software, uh, actually if you work in engineering period, you have some sort of internal documentation that is pointed at your uh, employees that's saying, this is what we've got, this is how we built it. Right? So how is this different? What is, what is a design review actually differentiating here? One of my favorite aspects of this is it is done before the work is started. I don't know uh, if you have had the singular joy of chasing around an engineer when you find something is updated going, hey, these docs are out of date, right? Like how many times have you run into, oh, this doesn't have the 1.1 update. This doesn't have the new feature we launched. I have been on both sides of that conversation more times than I can count. N nobody is having fun. Neither of those participants is enjoying their day. So one of the nice baselines for me here is this is done before work is started. This does mean you'll get at least some level of drift, right? Things change in implementation. It's not going to look exactly how the design review looked. But OK, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but your internal systems doc already doesn't look exactly how the software looks. If you need the exact answer, you're going to have to go to the product itself. But this gets us close. Secondly, and this is handy in the aforementioned bottom-up org that I keep talking about, it is a much easier baseline to establish. Right? It's not that hard to get everybody to agree. We want to change the thing. Let's all sit down and talk about what we're changing. This, when compared to internal systems documentation, it varies massively in its level of granularity, right? What should I write down about a system I'm building? I'll probably write down its inputs and outputs, but what about the idiosyncrasies that I found while I was building it? What about the little tricks for building something in it? Like, you're not going to find this, generally speaking, in your systems documentation. And this has been a side benefit that I didn't really think of when I first started looking at this. It captures historical state. Right? So uh, recall that I mentioned that 12-year history now, right? Pardon me. Our iOS purchase flow has been around for at least in its current state, I would guess, seven or eight years of that 12-year history, right? 
a lot of things have changed in that over time. There's basically geological strata in there of this person really likes async await, this person likes callbacks. Oh, I see a reorg here, everything changed. Hey, Bob over here comments everything extensively, so this area is just gonna have like a paragraph before every method. Like, there's different things in here. Design reviews actually capture a lot of that state. Uh, you can go back, uh, if you really like reading old software documentation, like almost nobody does, but I enjoy. Uh, you can go back and you can see the changes that have been made, and it, it provides a lot of rationale for the system you're working in. This is something that not only doesn't, but really shouldn't exist in most internal systems docs, right? A systems doc is supposed to be the living version of the system. It's how it exists today. And so a lot of that history gets omitted that is actually really handy for your engineers to come up to date on things. Okay, so we're gonna have a short sidebar here uh, about the joys of working with engineers. Uh, here you see our girls going to town on last year's Christmas tree. tree. Goats absolutely love a Christmas tree. It's the best way to dispose of it. Uh, if anybody's in Eugene and you have a Christmas tree, hit me up, uh, I will happily deliver it to the girls. Uh, so I'm actually uh, going to take a fairly safe assumption and say everybody in, in the room here has worked with engineers at some point in the past. It's, it's really fun, right? It's delightful. We're, we're very normal about the things that we prioritize in life. We keep very predictable and sensible hours, uh, and we definitely don't get worked up about random things. Uh, <laughs> But actually, for the context of this, I'm going to tell you that working with engineers is a lot like working with goats. I don't know if you've had the fun of trying to make a goat do something. That is an exercise in frustration. The goat usually kind of enjoys it, but you're not having any fun at all, right? Uh, and just as soon as you look away from whatever you are attempting to force a goat to do, it is off committing crimes in another direction that you have not noticed. If you want a goat to do something, you really need to convince the goat that it's a good idea, right? Like, you need to make that the shortest path to something a goat wants. Candy is usually good, something it wants to eat. Engineers are a lot like this. Uh, if I, I, part of this is just because I'm an obstreperous person, but if, if you come in and you just say, hey, Sean, go do this like this, uh, I've got at least eight Ys lined up already. Right, like, why am I doing this? What, why would I listen to you? Uh, and it's going to turn into a whole conversation. Uh, I guess I'm also pretty food motivated, so you could probably lead me around with some candy. Uh, but in this case, I didn't actually have the ability to give candy to everybody at Tender. Um, so our solution was to sit every, all of the engineers down in a big room and ask them what they wanted. No, no, that's terrible. That, that sounds like the meeting of my nightmares, just an endless uh, array of special interests. But what we actually did is we formed a working group. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of an idea about what working groups look like at Tinder, uh, because I am a big fan. Uh, it has become a, a, a real staple of how we get major change done within our organization. Uh, so the quick pillars of this are representative membership. Remember I said teams have a lot of autonomy. They get to roughly do what they want. If you want to change something across our whole org, you need to get buy-in from the people involved. So everybody that's going to be involved in this change, they need to have the ability to come in and yell about whatever it is that they feel is important to yell about. Secondly, you want executive sponsorship. Our C-suite does actually do things, right? They're not going to be able to come in and just tell you what to do, but at some point they're going to have to rubber stamp something. So you're going to need to be able to find somebody at a senior leadership level that will put their stamp on this working group and say, this is a, a, a thing that is good for us to change, it's a thing we wanna change, and the output of this group is something that I agree with. Third, and this is one of my favorite facets of this that keeps things actually moving forward, advisor positions, right? So this is, when you ask, hey, I'm gonna change something like our documentation platform, hey, I'm gonna change the way that your team does work, you're gonna get a whole lot of opinions, right? Uh, a big facet of the working group is the people who are doing the bulk of the work, the bulk of the research, the bulk of the writing, they are the people whose opinions are most heavily weighted. But pretty much anybody can get an advisor position. 
So this is the senior engineer that doesn't have a lot of time. This is uh, the senior management that wants to make sure I'm not putting a spoke in their wheels. They can get an advisor position and they are welcome to advise. But it is understood that their opinion will be at least slightly less weighted than the people who are actually doing the work. And finally, the other pillar for this is limited duration. This is what keeps uh, our senior people from just being in 50 meetings per month, right? So you're gonna have a limited scope on your working group when it's created. If it's a large scale working group, like our design review working group, we had a 12 month scope. A small working group might have a three month scope. At the end of that scope, you're going to deliver something and you're gonna fold. You might be able to make an argument for, we are making a lot of progress, we can still produce uh, a lot more stuff, cool, we'll extend the scope of this group. Most likely, we're gonna say the things you didn't get to were less important, we're gonna deprioritize those, and you can spin up another working group if this becomes a big problem. And then a little bonus here that I'm a fan of, uh, working groups are a wonderful opportunity for advancement, right? So we are generally working at the team level. The team is kind of the atomic level for a lot of uh, companies today, right? So your scope is naturally going to be confined to your team. Within a working group, you get a chance to tackle broad multi-team problems. You get a chance to do a whole lot of research, a whole lot of presenting. And this is a good way for, especially like junior and mid-level people, to stretch their wings a little bit, right? Uh, get exposed to topics that they wouldn't normally, become an expert on something that they wouldn't normally run into in the scope of their day-to-day -day work, and then show that off to the larger org, uh, or God forbid, get up on stage and talk to it, talk about it. So, I am a big fan of working groups. Uh, I will kindly assume, for the purposes of us moving forward, that you are now at least a moderate fan of working groups. So, having formed this working group, we are trying to figure out, once again, what, what is the candy, what is the food that we are going to lead all of these obstreperous engineers forward with? And we found that what they mostly wanted in our new documentation, our news design reviews, was these three things. One, search, right? It needs to be easy to find. I need to know where it is, or I need some sort of automated search so that I can find out, I wanna update the thing, where's the thing? That's fairly easy. Easy to update. So this is where we need to start standardizing things, right? It needs to be very simple to understand. This is what I'm writing. This is how I would write a new thing. And this is how I would go about then distributing that written thing to the rest of the company. And then this is kind of a catch-all, but this is something that we ran into a lot. What about blank? What about my special interest, right? Um, I hate mermaid diagrams. How do I get lucid chart in there? I hate lucid chart. How do I get a plant, U, uh, plant UML diagram in there? I really want to be able to uh, automate these API calls. So uh, it needs to be a very extensible platform. It needs to be very flexible in order to handle these broad use cases. It's also, we have an MVP situation here. So we need something that is going to be expandable over time. So uh, what did we actually end up building? Uh, we went with, and I feel like uh, having seen the sessions uh, so far this week, I'm not going to surprise a whole lot of people with some of these tools. Uh, we standardized with Markdown, um, so all of our design reviews are written in Markdown, and they're stored in GitHub. Advantages of this, keeps the engineers where they live, right? GitHub is a little complex for exposing to your average writer. I write in it every day, so I'm, uh, we're not confusing the engineers with putting them in GitHub. We get change tracking over time. Uh, we don't have to worry about, hey, how did this shift? How did this change? That's what Git does. And a nice facet here, design review becomes PR review. So that whole process where I said we were going to write the thing down and then distribute it out, that just becomes reviewing a pull request, which is what I do every day. And then finally, automate all the things, right? So whenever you're building a new documentation platform, they're gonna, uh, you're gonna get a lot of questions about how do I get it over here? How do I get it in this format? How do I automate this update, this change track, et cetera? I already have 50 engineers who know how to automate things on GitHub. I don't have to teach anybody a new skill. And then uh, some things that I had to learn in the course of the working group. Uh, we used MKDocs and Mermaid.js. So MKDocs is a static site generator built in Python uh, that we use to uh, take these markdown docs because we don't want to require everybody to go get in GitHub in order to read that design review and publish it out to an internal static site. So that makes it a lot friendlier for the, friendlier for the people consuming it. 
Um, and then mkdocs plugins give us those af aforementioned search, right? So we want it to be easy to find. We've got a plugin for search. We've got a plugin for tagging. It's very easy to get two things. And then uh, one of the things that we really emphasized here was keeping things as textual as possible, right? I'm not going to stop you from checking in a diagram. Everybody, like, we've got screenshots, we've got Lucid Chart, we've got Glyphy in there somewhere. But I'm going to try and keep you editing in text. Uh, so here's an example of a Mermaid.js diagram. Uh, Mermaid.js is a little JavaScript package that will take a series of commands and turn them into one of the helpful uh, architecture diagrams that I work in day in and day out. So it, it makes me draw less boxes and lets me write more words, which is generally going to be faster. Ooh. Testing? Okay. Uh, and then standardize and simplify with our templates. So. As previously mentioned, uh, we have a lot of different teams, we have a lot of different guilds, and we wanted them to be able to learn from each other. And what this means is if I figure out a thing is important to capture in design review, I'm going to put that in the template, right? I'm just gonna check that, temp the templates are all in GitHub, and then when I wanna do design review, I'm gonna take that template, copy it out, I'm gonna fill it out. I am a fan of this because it lets me add a thing for another team to use without requiring that team to use it, right? So I've got a section here for, say, launch plan. If your team doesn't care about that for some reason, I'm not gonna go argue that with you because that's your problem, but you can just delete that when you copy over the template. It's just markdown. Drop that section, write what you want, review what you want. This allows me to enhance things for your team without having to be dictatorial about what your team does. So, uh, how has this gone so far? We're about 15 months in. This was actually a 2023 scoped uh, project, uh, and I am happy to report we have 500 plus closed pull requests. Not every one of these is a design review. Sometimes you're just updating, you know, oh, the API call on that review changed, so I'm gonna go tick that up. But by far, the, the largest margin of these are design reviews, so that's really cool to see. And near and dear to my heart, we have 100 different contributors, so 100 different people have checked in at least one design review. Uh, across an org of 300 engineers, that's really good, right? And for me especially, I love seeing a junior engineer check in a design review. These are docs that at a lot of other companies, especially larger ones, you wouldn't get to see people do until they were very senior. So it's nice to see them be able to walk through this process and understand what we as an organization feel makes good software. Uh, we distributed templates for our six guilds initially, so back end, our client guilds of iOS and Android, uh, ML, web, and data, and the, one of my personal success stories here, we did miss two guilds, right? Our cloud automation and observability guilds, we missed them for templates. They came to me a few months later and said, hey, we'd really like to use this. Could we check a template in? I don't know how many of you have built another competing internal docs platform, but to have a team say, hey, that's cool, I'd like to use it, that, that was a wonderful stamp of approval. I was thrilled. So generally speaking, I would say we have a crowd of happy goats now, and we're generally happy with uh, the output. Um, I am running out of time, so I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, and I am going to say, uh, always remember your collaborators. Uh, this is Tilly right here. This is actually us at the American Dairy Goat Association National Competition last year. Uh, we tried really hard, we almost got not last once. Um, so I, I believe in her this year, Tilly and I, we, we're not gonna go to nationals, uh, but we are gonna go to a couple of goat shows and I believe in our ability to get not last. Um, I will note my partner usually has something way up the rankings, but Tilly and I are getting there. Uh, and as I said, here's the design review working group. Uh, it really, I wouldn't be able to get up on this stage and talk without the output of all of them. It was amazing to work with them. I learned a lot in the process, and our advisors were incredibly useful in explaining, like, the, the amount of seniority that I have in that advisor column is fantastic, right? There's a couple hundred years worth of uh, engineering knowledge there that we definitely benefited from. And Jewel here would like to take any questions that you've got. Thank you. <laughs> Heavy chairs. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your talk, Sean. That was illuminating. Um, I've been pestering speakers on and off for pictures of cute things in their presentation, so I'm glad that fi some, finally somebody delivered. I'm glad I could help there. <laughs> Should I stick with this or swap to that? What are you more comfortable with? This thing keeps trying to fall off, so I'll Okay, yeah. Hi. Yeah, it's really interesting, I think, that a lot of companies struggle with where to bring in more teams into the development process, and to know that it's worked so well at the design review stage, I think it's something that a lot of companies can try to take some inspiration from and experiment with, so it's really cool to know. Um, one of the questions we got is whether you ever deal with the perception that having more reviewers slows the ability to release work down. Um, how do you get buy-in um, with other teams without people worrying about sacrificing speed? A hundred percent. That was a question that we got a lot. Uh, and mostly, uh, I will admit, I was motivating people via fear there uh, because we grew a lot uh, in the past handful of years and a lot of what spawned this working group was things breaking, right? And so it's not so much a hey, this is going to go terribly if you don't adopt my platform, but check it out, we had some teams that struggled, we figured out a way to help them address those problems. If you, would, if you think that you can completely avoid these problems, drive on, keep doing your thing. But if you think you would benefit from this, we have this platform, we got a template right here, feel free to check it out and move forward. Um, and would you say that implementing this kind of review process would be more of a process change or more of a cultural change? That's a good question. It, it, it kind of ended up being both, right? I, I will say I feel like the culture change was snuck in there, <laughs> right? Because most people saw it as, oh, this is the new process, right? And people are kind of used to, okay, we have a new process. How do I adhere to this? But one of the things that I loved about it was as teams started to fill out these templates, right? So a as you go and you say, hey, uh, you, you get to, say, the launch flags, part of the template, right? And you're like, okay, here's the switches that I need for launch. All of a sudden, I'm teaching that team Here's what I monitor on launch. They're thinking, oh, hey, I should be monitoring this when I launch my thing. It was something in the template. So it's a way you can kind of sneak culture in via process. Wow, I think that could be a talk all on its own. 2026. <laughs> yes, please. Um, and have you seen more folks updating systems documentation now that they're also contributing uh, design docs? Uh, that has been, it, it's really varied. Um, so we do have existing systems docs, and what I'm starting to see is people saying, I did the design review, right? I put a lot of work into that. Here's this diagram, here's this explanation, here's this API call. How do I get that over to my systems docs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that is an answer that we are currently frantically developing um, <laughs> with our cloud automation team. So we have uh, the ability to take pieces of content from a design review and copy them over to your systems docs in an automated way. So uh, there's like a backend binding that says, here's this system, here's the review for it, here's the docs for it, and then it'll shift some of that over. But that work will hopefully be detailed in a future talk. Perfect, and then one quick question, hopefully it's quick. How do you find that participating in these reviews sort of flows through to the end user docs at the end? Oh, end user, uh? Yeah, I, I would say that's actually not something we've run into. Um, we don't have a lot of external facing user docs. Tinder is pretty much just the little icon on your phone. Um, I will say actually I've had this question come up because we're doing, uh, like we have partner APIs, so like uh, where companies are like doing business with Tinder, and I've gotten a lot of questions about, okay, we've now defined something for this partner for how they're gonna integrate with my system can I take that and publish that to an external site? Um, currently, our static site is internal, so that is going to be a large process with security and how we're gonna handle all that. But uh, I've, I've had a lot of questions about that, TBD. Yeah, you're kind of in a place where we're, <laughs> we've got an interest in it. Thank you so much, Sean, that was fascinating.